welcome back everybody. We are back to our router table, our little mini router table. That is way too fancy for what it has to be, but it is giving me the practice to for my cabinet work again, for making face frames, for doing the boxes. Figure out little things where I've messed up, stuff you know I haven't done in a lot of years. So it's good to have a project like this to practice on. Now this whole series is, is geared more for the person starting out trying to learn how to do this stuff. It's not so much for the professionals that have been doing it for a lot of years, because I am certainly not a professional. I'm just, I'm just one of those guys who's been lucky enough to do enough different things throughout life that I've gotten to experience a lot of different trades. Um, I'm one of these people where I, I never hire anybody to do anything, so if I want nice things, I don't run out and buy them, I make them. And you learn so much doing that. That's how I learned timber framing, that's how I've learned about cabinet work, and there's a lot of stuff that I don't know. There are times where I'm shooting these videos where I'll go and research something uh, the day before I shoot the video just to make sure that I'm passing you decent information along. I said a lot of the stuff I do know fairly enough to be confident to tell you this is how I do it. But, so we, we titled this series DIY Custom Cabinets on a Budget. And the reason we titled this series that because all the things that we've been building with these titles on them over the last couple of weeks is all stuff that's going to help you make really nice cabinets even if you're a beginner. And that's what it's all about. It's all about sharing the information, learning from each other. I have a lot of professionals, and I'm not being a smart ass, I have a lot of true professionals that watch this channel, and they offer up good advice that helps me present better content for you when it comes to building things like this. So, tonight is no different. Tonight's going to be a little bit more instructional. It's going to be a smaller part of the router table, but it's a, such an integral part, and that is going to be the fence. So anything that you're building for yourself with a fence and with a table, it has to be right, and it has to be right on the money. That's why you see a lot of people make things out of MDF and melamine, is because it's usually so flat and so stable. Whereas plywood, you are going to run into some issues. This won't be as much of a problem for me because of all the, the box itself, the pieces we have in there that are going to help hold everything rigid and square. But if this was just a big wide open span on this table, you know, it would have a tendency, we could get some racking and things on this. Now, biggest thing, like I said, nice flat table, a nice square fence. Now a router fence isn't something that's going to be left in the same place all the time. So however you choose to mount that router fence, however you choose to build it, you got to be able to adjust it. Um, I don't mind just clamping it onto the sides of something. That's never bothered me to do that. You could cut slots in it with knobs to adjust it back and forth, leave one end on a pivot because it doesn't have to be square on this tabletop, not by a long stretch. If this was a bigger router table, we put a channel down here for a miter gauge, things like that, so you can set up feather boards and things like that. The biggest thing I use a router table for is to make styles and rails. I use it to rabbit panels, things like that. I'm usually not using it for a lot of really, it's fine stuff, but it's not a lot of decorative stuff. It's very utilitarian what I use one of these for. If I want to do a nice edge on something, yeah, I can do a round over bit on this and it'll work well. But I don't mind just putting that in a regular router and doing a freestand, especially if you have the router bits that have the nice ball, the nice bearings on them. So anyway, we're going to make this fence out of three quarter inch maple plywood, because that's what we have. And we're going to get into the design of that fence and it's going to be no frills, nothing fancy, something to get us going, something that we can use because to make the rest of this stuff, I'm going to need to use this router table to do that. So anyway, I'm going to quit yakking at you because this is another long introduction. We're going to get some plywood cut. We're going to start putting this thing together. I'll see you on the other side of it. pieces cut for our fence for this router table. Now this is going to seem pretty intuitive to most of you, but for those of you who are new to this, this is like I said, this is what this is about. So anyway, I don't want to start 
with my fence like this, for me personally, I'd rather have it down here and make this base a little longer there. That's just how I prefer it. That doesn't mean you have to do it that way, but that is how I prefer it. So what I do to put this together, I glue it and I put pocket screws in. But you want to clamp it really well because what happens with the pocket screws, we've discussed this before, it'll actually take these part pieces and when you go to, to screw it together, it'll actually push that down. And I'm exaggerating this so you guys get the idea of what it does. It'll push it down. Now, do I care if this is bowed a little bit? Eh, it's not a big deal, not on a router table. If it was something else a little more critical, absolutely. But the big thing I'm concerned about is that it's straight, that it's not bowed or anything like this. Now this plywood, we've mentioned it before, the way it is stacked in the, uh, the home desk spot and blows bins is they just put like two bunkers under it and then the whole pile sags. So if you have bow that you're going to have to contend with, when you're going to put this stuff together. So to fix that, we have two good straight cuts on here. If you're really worried about it, take your four foot level or whatever level you have that's nice and straight, nice and true, and set it across there. Make sure you can't see light through it. Then you know you've got it good and straight. But what that'll do, when I put this piece up to it, it'll take any bow out of this when we go to put it together. Now, the total length of the fence on this thing only needs to be 33 and a half inches. And uh, so that's all we're going to make it. I'm not doing anything fancy with this. I'm just setting it up so that we can clamp it to the, to the router table. But anyway, let's get to the chop saw. We'll cut these up. We'll start drilling our pocket holes. We'll get ready to assemble this part of it. have seen me use on this channel a few times here recently lately is my Craig setup it's nothing it's a Craig Pro kit I think it's just over a hundred bucks when I bought it I've had this for 11 years 10 11 years something like that and I tell you what it just keeps coming back for more it's easy to use I like it now I've had a few comments on the use of Craig jigs, Craig uh, pocket holes, Craig screws, things like that. The Craig jig is one of those things, it's a love-hate thing in the woodworking community. It is great for guys like myself who are always learning, trying to get better at your game. And then as you go along, you start to learn better joinery techniques. And a lot of times, the more you learn, the less you use this thing. Where the Craig jig shines, where I really like it, is making shop tools, things like that, jigs, making, uh, securing face frames to cabinets. I like it quite a bit. Putting boxes together for cabinets, but you know the one we're going to be working on for the house, we're going to wrap, we're going to uh, rabbit everything out, and the shelves and everything are going to slide together because I feel it makes a much stronger cabinet. Because when you are, when you're going through plywood on the Craig jig. And I have had it happen a few times and it drives me nuts every time it does. Once in a while, these screws, when they travel through these layers, if it hits dead center on a seam, a lot of times it's going to split that, especially if you're near an edge and it'll drive you nuts. So now when you're making your fence for a router table, you have to accommodate for that bit being in the middle because this fence has to be able to go over top of the router table. So when you have it set up, say your router bit's out here, your fence goes in, you have to compensate for that. So what we're going to do, I notch out this, and then I notch out this. This guy right here, I notch it a little bit higher, and this one I try to stay, I don't go as far in. The deepest notch I'll look for is like two inches. So we'll go in an inch and a quarter on this back piece because remember we have another three quarter inch. The reason for that, the reason I don't just cut this in half, and I started to like a dumbass, I don't just cut this in half because this guy right here, I need this to stay straight to everything I'm working on. And if I go and cut this in half, all we're going to have to keep things straight and lined up is a thin strip on this and that's going to be no good. What will happen is that will allow this thing to to bow on you if you're not careful. You'll have to set it up with a straight edge every time. 
ask me again how I know. I did that on the first router stand and it drove me absolutely insane. So this right here is going to be the table of the fence, whatever you want to call it. I want to line this guy up with it. Now I know this is all, for a lot of you, this is going to be old hat. And I apologize if you feel like your time is wasted. But there's a lot of novices out there, including myself, that benefit quite often from stuff like this because a lot of people in the YouTube world, they don't think of uh, they don't think of sharing that information because it's just it's so mundane to them, and they just figure everybody knows it. And you see that quite often. Come on, get in there. There you go. And to be honest with you, once this fence is built right here. We really, we can use this thing, no problem. Before we cut this out, we want to get a little sawdust channel around here. That will help keep your fence clear quite a bit. You only need to go an eighth of an inch is just fine. So you just use your table saw blade. You set it, say, uh, two and seven eighths, and you just get that blade so it's just nibbling like that first layer right there. So we're going to hit that and then we'll start drilling holes and putting this together. Before I go and put this together, one thing worth mentioning, remember how we've said a million times here lately, we always keep a little emery cloth in the shop. I want to soften these edges right here a little bit because what will happen as you're running your boards across there, sometimes they'll have a tendency to get hooked right there and it can be really frustrating for you. And it doesn't take much, just a little bit, just to bull nose that over a little bit. So I've been replenishing my woodworking supplies because who the hell knows, after 10 years of not really doing it, who the hell knows where everything ended up. I guarantee you the more I clean that old shop out, I bet you I find clamps. I'm finding bar clamps here and there, but I used to have a lot of clamps like this kicking around in there. And I tell you, to be honest with you, I just go to Harbor Freight for them now. These clamps were four bucks a piece. These are three dollars a piece. The thirty, the three footers, this style, they're a nine dollars a piece. And I know it kind of sucks that you're buying Chinese ship, but at the same time, at the same time, they make it. If you're on a tight budget, they really make it hard not to do that, and it really kind of stinks. That is the way of the world now. But some things, you know, you, you buy the best quality you can afford. Alright, let's clamp this guy up. Alright, so we're going to work our clamping down. I'm just going to get a little bit of glue. I don't have to go crazy with it. I mean, this is the job. The whole reason you're using the Craig screws, but I find that if something splits out on me, it's nice to be able to have that little bit of extra grab there. To be honest with you, most of the time, wood glue ends up being stronger than the wood. It's going to be fun is when we get into making some animal hide glue and stuff like that, and we get into some of the traditional projects I want to do. And it's pretty neat how easy that is to make, but how good it is. 
it's almost as strong as epoxy, but the drawback to it is it does not stand moisture very well. But you look at all your old colonial furniture that's still around, held together with animal hide glue. Now, I think it was Matthias Wandel, the guy, the wooden gears guy. He did a really, yeah, I'm going to drag you guys nuts, wipe that right in my pants. You know why? Because I can. Now, Matthias Wandel guy, or whatever the hell his name is, the wooden gear guy, he did an excellent, excellent video on wood glues and testing them out and what's actually, you know, he compared all the tight bond glues and all that good stuff. And it was interesting what he found. He found that just good old fashioned yellow wood glue holds stronger than just about any of it. I thought that was really cool. I was not expecting that, that kind of an outcome. Okay, so the best way that I know of to make sure that this is perfectly square to each other, cut yourself some good square gussets. We're going to pop a couple pocket holes in each one of these, and then we're going to use glue and our clamps to hold them in place while we screw them in. Alright, so if you guys, if you did everything correct, and you followed all your steps, you should have no daylight all the way down through. Only daylight you see, I'll move my hand, if I cover that up, it's the light shining through through the middle of the square here. But, check it all the way down, worst comes to worst, you have to do a little sanding to get your table perfect. If you're looking to keep that beautiful veneer on that cabinet plywood, keep in mind it is extremely thin. But that is perfectly square to that tabletop all the way down through. At this point, I could do absolutely nothing else to this thing, and it is perfectly ready to go, ready for use. Definitely going to want to put some poly or something on top of this so your boards slide nice. We're going to be doing that as well. It's supposed to get down to 24 tonight, so we're obviously not going to do it tonight. But we're going to do a little more to this thing. But I needed to get the fence built so that we could make some doors and what have you to trim this off. Now, like I said, this is perfectly usable at this point. It's not going to go anywhere. It's not, I can tell you it's nice and solid. So, to be honest with you, I may do something different than drill holes for clamping. I may glue some emery cloth onto the bottom of this so that when I set it on the bench it doesn't move. Chances are though it would probably be much safer and much better to use with clamps. Maybe we'll try it out without them and see how much it moves. I mean, it's not really moving too easily right now. But anyway, that's how you build a nice square fence. Again, you want to make sure this top is nice and straight. You put a straight edge on it, check it corner to corner, see if you have any low spots. Sand where you need to sand if you have to. 
Like I said, keep in mind though, the veneer is extremely thin on this stuff. Um, so you definitely want to use like a plywood product or a melamine or whatever, even steel. You could make a nice steel top router table, which I'd love to make one eventually, like a, a true uh, spindle, or a, geez, help me out here, a shaper or something along those lines. But for what I'm doing right now, for what the, the projects I have in store, this is absolutely perfect for my needs. I did have a viewer mention that, geez, that's awful tall by the time you set it on a bench. And I kind of like that when I'm running the router. I like to be, maybe it's not the smartest thing in the world, but I like to be really close to the work so I can see exactly what's going on. And also, I'm tall enough where I hate bending in any way. I'd rather be able to stand here and feed through and really be able to see what I'm doing really well. And a lot of times, if you can see what you're doing really well, you can catch problems before they become major problems. But all you do to adjust this is just held on the clamps. I mean, nothing, nothing major. You can leave the one end clamped and just swing, or you can move both ends. I like to just leave one, one end clamped down well, swing it around where I have to go, and go from there. I don't care if I'm running straight across here. That, that doesn't matter one bit. All that matters is where that board is in relation to that bit right there. Now what we have left to do on this, we're going to be putting a strip of black cherry all the way around here. We have some end grains to cover up on the plywood. Again, cabinet practices. We're doing cabinet, we're getting ready for cabinet work, so I'm getting my practice, you know, getting practiced up a little bit for it. Um, so anyway, there it is so far. Next video up, we'll keep working on this, and we're just going to keep working on it till it's done. Then, I, then um, we'll do a overview video, which will just be fancy editing, not a lot of explanation, just like we did with the planer stand build. So anyway, hope you guys enjoyed it, and I'll see you on the next one.